Host, co-host, uh, are we ready to begin? Uh, yeah, sure. Please proceed. I, uh, has uh, our uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor joined us? Yeah, he has joined. Oh, Hello, sir, and good evening to you. Sir, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. I have un unmuted. Good evening to you. How are you doing? Yeah, fine, sir. Uh, yes, we shall, uh, Dr. Yes. Ghosh, you can start with the program. Thank you, sir. Uh, a very warm welcome. To everyone, uh, we are here in the part two international webinar series on biodiversity conservation and sustainable development issues, challenges, and outcomes. So far, we have had a huge response and very meaningful deliberations from speakers uh, from various fields in biodiversity conservation. Today's uh, sub theme is the role of artificial and human intelligence 
in biodiversity conservation. And we have very interesting talks coming up on use of ecological niche modeling in biodiversity conservation, as well as the role of IUCN in biodiversity conservation. Our speakers have joined, I hope, uh, Dr. Narayani Bharve from Florida Museum, University of Florida, USA. And I can see Dr. Devabrutta Shaha from the Transdisciplinary University of Health Sciences and Technology, Bangalore. I welcome both of them. And we are extremely delighted to have with us our Honorable Vice Chancellor, West Bengal State University, uh, Professor Basup Chaudhary. I welcome you, sir. And let me just give you a profile of our participants. We are extremely uh, happy to have participants from all over India, Egypt, Australia, Nigeria, and Bangladesh. And it's more interesting to look at the participants' profile where about 36% of the participation is from faculties of various universities and colleges, as well as institutions. We have about 22% of PG students. We have another 24% of UG students, 10% uh, of uh, researchers, and another 6% of uh, other civil societies who have joined, who are interested in uh, biodiversity conservation. So in that background, I would like to start today's session. And for that, I invite and I welcome our honor respected principal, Ma Madam, uh, Professor Papia Chakravorty, uh, to kindly deliver a welcome address for today's session. Ma'am, are you there? Professor Papia Chakravorty? I, I had just seen her once. I think she's logged out. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Ma'am is there. Could you, uh, put thank you, your... thank you, Dr. Ghosh. So today we have reached the second day of the international webinar series part two. And we have gathered a lot of information and a lot of knowledge about biodiversity conservation and sustainable development issues and challenges. Now, the, during the first session of this uh, part two of this series, we had discussed on the role of government and academic institutions in biodiversity conservation. So this was dealt with from uh, the government. One uh, eminent speaker uh, who is an IAS, and uh, he dealt with the government policies and the other one from the academia, from the industry, uh, from the university. So a faculty from the university who was who is working on biodiversity conservation. So now uh, we are actually covering all aspects of biodiversity conservation issues, challenges, and uh, how to go for sustainable development. So today our topic deals with artificial and human intelligence in biodiversity conservation. Here we have our eminent speakers uh, who will be speaking on the IUCN, the threat and uh, the threatened species which IUCN red list contains. We have around 32,000 threatened species, which is the latest uh, record from the IUCN red list, where which is the most comprehensive information source from global conservation status of animals, plants, and fungi. Now, from this we'll uh, learn from our speaker uh, his topic, which will be dealt with today. Uh, I welcome you, sir, Dr. Devo Broto Shaha. And the, another one is very interesting, the use of artificial intelligence in ecological niche modeling. Here, the niche modeling is dealt with like species distribution modeling. And here the, you, they use the con computer algorithms to predict the distribution of a species across the globe. And various correlative and mechanistic models are used and variety of mathematical methods in the modeling algorithms and various softwares are now available where this modeling is being dealt with. So we will hear from Dr. Narayani Bharve from Florida Museum University of Florida. Welcome you, ma'am. And I am really honored to have with us our own Vice Chancellor, Sir Professor Bashuk Chaudhuri, 
who will deliver the inaugural address today. And after a great persuasion, we could uh, achieve his presence here because of his very tight schedule. I understand that, sir. So I welcome you here to deliver the inaugural address. And once again, I welcome all the participants who are with us for all these days repeatedly and are gathering knowledge on biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. So thank you, the organizers. And on behalf of VKC College, I welcome all the participants here. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for setting the stage for today's uh, session on biodiversity conservation. And we are extremely delighted and it's a wonderful pleasure to have Sir Bashuk Chaudhary with us. Sir, it's always been a pleasure to hear it to you. And today on this platform, uh, it's the first time we are listening to you on this platform. The PG Department of Botany welcomes you once again and kindly take the stage to deliver an inaugural address. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you are organizing a webinar uh, of great class, uh, one after the other. And uh, uh, I pay my uh, gratitude. I, I congratulate the principal of the college and uh, her staff, uh, teaching staff and non-teaching staff, all, all concerned, and the students for uh, keeping the quality of the webinars are so good. Um, uh, Madam has rightly said that uh, I am busy. In fact, you know, one hour ago, in our physics department, they are holding a webinar on uh, machine learning. And one uh, gentleman, uh, Shonmoy Ganguly by name, who is in Wiseman Institute of Technology, Institute of Science and Technology, doing his high energy physics, is delivering a beautiful lecture. So I did not want to be on that webinar for so long, but the lecture was so good that I heard up to five minutes to uh, four. And then I thought that, you know, I have to go to BKC College. So immediately I, <laughs> I stopped that lecture and came to BKC College. So that is basically the situation. One Again, at five o'clock, there is a webinar. So I cannot really concentrate on one webinar one day because, uh, you know, I have to go there. And if I do not go, people will think that, you know, I'm avoiding. So that is my situation. So Madam will perhaps understand. Uh, uh, so, uh, good afternoon to all of you, good afternoon to all the participants, good afternoon to the uh, respective speakers, Dr. Narayani Varbe from the Florida Museum, University of Florida, and Dr. Devabdato Shah from the Transdisciplinary University of Health Sciences and Technology, Bangalore. They will deliver on, uh, on um, uh, uh, subjects that have been already said by uh, the respected principal. Now, this is an international webinar series part two on biodiversity, conservation and sustainable development issues, challenges and outcomes. Um, in today's webinar, perhaps the way Madam said, uh, perhaps the modeling aspect or the or the computer based um, simulation and things like that will be discussed uh, to find out the species already 32,000 species have been talked about and things like that. All of us know what the sustainable development is. Uh, it was coined in the year 1972 in Stockholm Convention, all of you know. And uh, then uh, that, uh, you know, the unbridled pace of development that was going on, that development uh, the human society must try to curb, you know. Uh, uh, the scope uh, was uh, thought to be infinite, but you know, the scope is not infinite. And then at certain time, you know, the human civilization must stop uh, uh, tinkering with the with nature. Otherwise, nature takes a takes a revenge. And as you uh, see today in this pandemic situation, the SARS-CoV-2 and other things, people say that we are really playing a lot with nature, and nature is taking revenge and things like that. Sustainable development is basically development where uh, development which can be withstood by nature uh, to some extent. Otherwise, what will happen? There will be large scale deforestation. There will be water pollution, air pollution, soil pollution, pollution of, uh, of the, of the uh, universe in the sense that, you know, the ozone hole and things like that. 
ozone layer and uh, and the species will be destroyed all of you know so many butterflies will have been destroyed so many birds have been destroyed so many tiger species have been destroyed so many different uh, animals and um, you know they have been destroyed now we do not see them we do not all of us do not see them and we see them from a distance with a you know with a lot of sightseeing kind of activity we do not understand that our sustenance depends on them now human civilization is so much uh, you know obsessed with its own growth that it does not understand that there exists some other civilization somewhere else you know it it uh, stefan ye gould uh, he wrote a book ever since darwin i think uh, many of you have read this stefan ye gould is a, is a darwinian and uh, you know he was i think in mit or things like that you know i read that book so he is he argued in his book a very nice point you know that uh, a small creature is very happy with its surroundings and try is trying to uh, discover itself and uh, you know uh, having its own uh, life and we animals feel that you know it is a primitive uh, creature now if an amoeba can coexist with an other amoeba and you know can create um, a kind of world of their own what is your problem uh, that was the question he he raised ever since darwin uh, many of you have re- have uh, read the book so many times what really happens that you know human civilization con- considers its civilization to be the only civilization and the other civilizations you know uh the for example tigers may have their own civilizations they have they have their own world of their own existence of their own having their habitats of their own having their diversity of their own and they have created that now how do we know that you know the butterfly the birds the migratory birds which uh, you know the uh, locusts you know they have their civilizations you know they move from place to place and you know it is it is something interesting now uh, we always see these uh, animals from the point of point of view of conflict and not cooperation we never expect that there is there exists a lot of cooperation between animals and humans and if the animals are completely extinct humans will also be also be extinct, extinct. Uh, some time ago um, uh, you know uh, i read in current science one editorial where one great biologist was quoted by uh, quoted and he said that if all the insects are uh, destroyed the universe will be or the world will be will will be close to extinction but if all the humans are uh, destroyed it will take about 10000 years to build a civilization so see the interesting thing if the insects are destroyed then it will take it will perhaps not be the the world that we see will never be created the way we are seeing but if all human beings are destroyed then it will uh, take about 10000 years to build back this civilization so who is more important you know these are these questions now from that point of view sustainable point of view, development point of view biodiversity all of you know that you know these are different species different animals different plants you know uh, these uh, butterflies which move 14000 um, uh, miles they Uh, bring the uh, poll uh, you know they do the pollination uh, of the of a far away uh, plant far away plant with the plant over here in the eastern direction in the in the east i mean in our place so you know there is some amount of changes that take place and you know a, a plant of summer gets uh, some uh summer uh, diversity of the winter it did a plant of winter gets certain diversity of summer and things happen like that very very interesting so the point is that diversity will be talked about today uh through uh, you know through uh, modeling perspective ecological niche modeling and uh, dr devobdot shah will that, that will be uh, talked about by dr narayani varbe who has been in a very uh, erudite um, institution florida museum university of florida uh, you know um, uh, very erudite institution the other gentleman dr devobdot shah he will speak about the uh, use of iucn tools in threat assessment and monitoring of conservation status of biodiversity very very important because you know this conservation thing is very important if we do not conserve our species then it will be uh, it will be ultimately 
ultimately a difficult thing uh, for the human civilization i will not take much time they are all very erudite person and they have they are extremely busy so it is their time i thank the college from the bottom of my heart uh, for organizing one webinar after the other with such a great class they are selecting speakers and the speakers are so good i mean i i will thank dr papia chakraborty i will thank all the teachers of the uh, all of the college particularly the botany department and other departments the, the lady who uh, professor who is uh, who is uh, i mean anchoring the program she is also doing so well i mean uh, i am proud of them i am really proud of them when i find anything happening good in west bengal state university or colleges of the west bengal state university i feel that you know that uh, you know i i get limelight in the sense that you know it is my university my college so it is a great thing uh, i would not take much time i do not know whether i could really speak um, anything um, um, worthwhile but the point is i um, uh, welcome all the speakers i welcome all the persons who are um, taking part in from different um, continents and different places and different uh, countries um, uh, on this webinar i wish them all well i request them to uh, to to take all measures so that they can they stay safe uh, let them take care of themselves and their families and uh, follow the social uh, norms you know this physical distancing and things like that use mask use gloves protect yourself and protect also the animals because you know by we can always destroy with our power but then you know what you destroy ultimately will destroy you so that is important and i think the erudite speakers today will highlight those issues with a lot of information and uh, and uh, and what i should say intelligent logic and intelligent guesses thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir i mean there are so many shades to your inaugural speech but i will take the essence of it where you being a, a person of chemistry background you have given in a nutshell so beautifully the essence of uh, ecosystem and the nature of uh, the indispens indispensable nature of the ecosystem where man actually doesn't matters in the whole scheme of the thing and we hope uh, you continue with us with your guidance and we look forward to your leadership and we are extremely extremely honored by your presence today and i'm sure all the participants have geared up after your inaugural speech because it just shows how uh, such a good lucid uh, teacher you have been all your life thank you for thank your you, time and thank you dr bishu pagosh okay thank you dr bishu pagosh i know you're busy but if you can you could just uh, be with I, us i i i will be definitely for some time but at 5 o'clock again i have to go somewhere else sure sir no issue thank you so <laughs> thank much you. thank you we are going to uh, the next uh, program which is uh, uh, we would like to slide show a few activities of our department which we have been doing in every session and every session we have been showing you something different that we are doing we are very proud to present today a video Uh, that was prepared by our part 3 final year students i will welcome one of them here if he's uh, present and what they have done we had gone to meghalaya um, to visit the sacred grove moflang sacred grove and they have recorded few pieces from there they have used the photograph they have edited together and here you have the virtual uh, profile of the moflang sacred grove so it's a virtual ecotourism that we are doing today Uh, prepared by our part 3 final year students aditya and his friends after we finish i might call aditya please be around so a uh, host dr shuchishmita chakraborty can i ask you to kindly play the slide show for the sacred grove we yeah, have sure. talked about sacred grove earlier so we have a background of the sacred grove these are the relics of plant world totally conserved by traditional belief and have huge ecosystem services Sound please Perched on the East Khasi Hills near Maflang village and surrounded by fields Maflang sacred forest is one of the must see places in Meghalaya in remote northeast India There are many sacred forests in these hills and the state's Chempia Hills However this one is the most well known It may appear to be unremarkable and even somewhat disappointing to the uninitiated however a local khasi guide will unveil its mystery 
mountain with a local word, this forest we call Lao Kentang. L A W K Y N T A N G. Lao means a forest, Kentang means sacred. And then, you know, till now this forest also is more than 800 years old, untouched forest. You know, if we said untouched, it does not mean we cannot touch anything, but we cannot take anything out from here. Only eatable things, suppose, if you find inside, we can eat inside, we can use them inside, okay. but we cannot just to take it outside from here. Even with the local people also, we cannot take anything from the forest. So, uh, like inside of uh, inside the forest also, there are some medicinal tree and all, like Rudraksha tree also, I think most of you are Hindu, right? Rudraksha yeah. tree also is there inside the forest. And then, uh, like some stones, we call it uh, kind of a ritual stone, where ancient people used to perform ritual in the olden days. So the total area of this forest also is around 76.8 hectares. And then, you know, like uh, uh, here, Sound is a little low. So this is the guide who is actually explaining about the sacred grove, the area and the festivals that are there with the sacred grove and how the people do not take out even a leaf of the sacred grove because they have the belief that the deity who is residing in the sacred grove will be very angry and uh, she might be so angry that all bad things will happen to them. So they are very careful to leave everything inside the sacred grove, even a dry leaf. <coughs> and uh, very interestingly, all of our students did believe it and nobody car carried even a seed because it was very interesting to find Rudraksh tree growing in Meghalaya, where we do not have Rudraksh growing in, the in that kind of a phytogeography tropical region. And uh, all our uh, students were extremely excited and they wanted to carry a Rudraksh seed thinking of the uh, religious belief that they have or it, will, it may bring good luck to them. But eventually everyone left behind all the Rudraksh seeds inside the sacred grove. And this is a major part of the ecotourism as well as research uh, lab, the sacred grove. The Northeastern Hill University is carrying out a lot of research on the ecosystem services of the sacred grove. And the local people have been geared up, they have been trained uh, about all the biodiversity that's present in the sacred grove. This uh, guide, he knows all the trees that are present. He even knows scientific names of most of the trees. So a very knowledgeable guide we had and we were very lucky. Astonishing so, network of plants and trees all connected. Some of them, which are believed to be more than thousand years old, are full of ancient wisdom. There are many medicinal plants, including those that can apparently cure cancer and tuberculosis. And Rutraksh trees, the seeds of which are used in religious ceremonies. Orchids, carnivorous insect eating pitcher plants, ferns and mushrooms also abound. Although the forest has some impressive biodiversity, this alone isn't what makes it so sacred. According to local tribal beliefs, a deity known as Labasa inhabits the forest. It takes on the form of a tiger or leopard and protects the community. Animal sacrifices such as goats and roosters are performed for the deity at stone temples inside the forest in times of need such as illness. Members of the Khasi tribe also burn the bones of their dead inside the forest. Nothing is allowed to be removed from the forest as it may upset the deity. There are tales of people who have broken this taboo becoming sick and even dying. Thank you. Uh, Aditya, could you switch on your video? Our student? Aditya, are you here? Yes, there's Aditya. Uh, thank you so much uh, for creating this video. It will go down in the history of botany department and it will always uh, keep our memories alive of the field excursion that we had. Thank you so much. Okay, we move on to our first technical session. And uh, I would like to invite uh, my colleague, 
Dr. Dipanshu Vishwas, the host of this uh, session, to kindly come and introduce our speaker, Dr. Narayani Bharve from Florida Museum, University of Florida, USA. Dipanshu, could you kindly switch on your video? Dr. Dipanshu Vishwas? Okay, Narayani, could you kindly switch on your video? Hello, welcome. Hello. In spite of okay. such a busy schedule, you have been able to make it here. Uh, and we would like to thank you for all the efforts. I have been interacting with you and we have seen how busy you have been. And so we are very, very so thankful for your amazing. presence here today. Can I request Dr. Dipanshu Vishwas to kindly switch on your video? Is there any issue here? Uh, I will wait a few seconds, uh, Dr. Dipanshu Vishwas. Co-host, could you inform me, please? Um, hello, I yes. think uh, he's not there. Uh, could you please uh, continue with the introduction? Yeah, please hold on. Just give me a second. Hello. Yes, uh, uh, let me just introduce to our uh, audience. I was a little unprepared for this. Uh, Narayani, personally knowing you has been such an honor and to introduce you to our participants as uh, you have asked me earlier also, a large number of young students whom we wish you would inspire into uh, taking up the mode of niche modeling as a future uh, career. So here we have Narayani Bharve, who has completed her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology with a focus on species distribution. After completion of PhD, she joined Florida Museum of Natural History as a postdoctoral researcher and now works as assistant scientist. Her interest lies in understanding biogeographic patterns and processes with help of species distribution modeling. Species distribution models are data sensitive and data hungry. She's also interested in GIS and remote sensing applications. She has published 30 plus peer reviewed scientific papers in renowned journals. Congratulations on that. She has also reviewed multiple manuscripts and is also recipient of Google Summer of Code Scholarship and now participates in Google Summer of Code as a mentor. So that was a long journey and a very successful one, Narayani. So are you ready for your presentation or would you like to say a few things before you start? Over to you, Narayani. Um, yeah, no, thank you for the introduction, Vishwarupa. It was nice seeing you all and the young students here. And uh, that's it, I guess. And then yeah. maybe I can start with my presentation. Sure is yours. Uh, the screen is shared, I hope. Because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, talks, I guess, and then the time is less, so maybe it's better I start. Yeah, yeah, with the... sure, no issues, please. Yeah. A host, okay. is your screen shared? Co host, is Hello? your screen shared? Yes. Uh, Hello, ma'am. No, I... uh, would you? I... Yeah, you, you can share it. Uh, all right. You can start uh, sharing. No, it. I cannot share it because it okay. gives me host disabled. All right, all right. I've done that. You check it now. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, Narayani, yeah, yeah. I can. There I can. is any issue, Narayani? In case you have sure. any issue running the slide, you can ask the co-host to run for you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's just dive into the topic. I am going to talk more about uh, the ecological uh, niche modeling. I'm not sure. Can you see my presentation? Uh, it, it's coming up. Uh, it's coming up. It hasn't up, okay. started, yes. Oh, okay. So, so maybe I should wait. 
for a minute, or yes. I can just start. Yeah, it's come. You yes, can come. start now. Yes. Full screen. Okay. Yes. You can. You know, this is okay. Right. So uh, I think I'm going to stop my video. Maybe that's going to be easier. Yes, that could probably uh, help in streaming. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. So, um, so let's just dive into the topic. Uh, I was actually thinking that people might know something about ecological niche modeling. So I had my title as managing the pitfalls, but doesn't matter. I'm going to give you the introduction of ecological niche modeling and then talk about the factors you should consider when you use ecological niche modeling. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to talk about the species distribution models and then why do we use them? Why do we need them? And then the concepts behind like the ecological niche models and the, the framework, the logical con conceptual framework, which you should work with uh, species distribution models. So among that, there are these BAM concepts and then uh, geographical space and environmental space concepts. And then I will talk about some of the things uh, which you should be aware when you build the ecological niche models. So why do we need species distribution? Why are we so interested in species distribution? This is the long standing question which people are asking since ages. And you know, why do we need it? Why do we need it? Because we need to know where the species exist so that we can conserve them. We can find out if the habitat loss is actually reducing their distributions. We can find out if their niches are conserved over ages. We can also find out if the species can invade a certain area, which, uh, which is like many times in India, you can see Lantana camera is like invading everywhere in India. So that is the invasive potential that you can find out uh, from the species distributions. Also, you can look at the speciation, uh, speciation processes from species distributions. So some of the examples of those, uh, I'm going to talk about, but then simply uh, what we can uh, define species distribution model is nothing but an empirical model where you take field observations and environmental predictors uh, where those observations are found and then you do the statistical uh, correlations and then develop the response curves from those observations and then use those response curves to predict the potential distribution probability of the species in the geographic area. So Zimmerman and uh, Gizan define this uh, species distribution model definition, which is very simple and crisp. So you will see in the literature, there are many different names for the species distribution models, habitat suitability index, climate envelope models, occupancy model, uh, resource selection model, gap models. These all models are kind of doing the same thing with species distribution, but there are differences within those subtle differences. I'm not going to talk about the details about these, the differences between them. I'm going to concentrate more on the ecological niche models here. So why do we use these models? So Traditionally, uh, how we used to get uh, arrive at the species distribution, you go to the field, collect the data, then you come back and you, then you develop the ranges. You go more and more in the field, you know more and more where the species can occur, and then you become an expert. And then from the expert knowledge, you draw the ranges and then your range becomes perfect. But the problem is, which is pretty time consuming and costly. So we always need the field data, but sometimes we can use the uh, uh, we can use this informatics tool available to us to uh, develop these correlative models and then you know give the areas where the species can potentially occur. So some of the uses of those uh, these uh, uh, SDMs like or species distribution models or ecological niche models is. Uh, one, you can just see that how uh, the species uh, responses to the environmental gradient. So here they used 
um, elevation as the environmental gradients, and then they try to find out how the species is responding to the uh, to those gradients. You can use the species distribution models to do conservation planning or uh, pro design protected areas. So in this case in Madagascar, they use uh, multiple taxonomic data and high resolution geographic data, and then generated distribution models and then come up with the, uh, uh, with the areas where you see higher biodiversity so that you can use, uh, you can conserve them with the less money, right? So this is one use. Then the other use like invasion, species invasion, so the native range of this uh, of this plant species is Southeast Asia, but which got introduced in United States and now it is it has become an invasive species. So to understand how the species can invade and where it can invade to find out the invasive potential of the species, you can use species distribution models. The other use you can <clears throat> here in this example, they did they did try to find out how the climate change and land use are going to affect the species distributions. So you can use the current distribution of the species, project it in future, and find out where the species are going to be. Also, this is a cool paper. You should all read this paper. In this paper, what they did, so these are the red circles are their sites from where they collected the data. They generated niche models. Then they found out that these blue and green regions are being shown as suitable for these species. So they went to those uh, green and blue areas and surveyed them. And then they found seven different new species of chameleons. So these are, this is one of the cool application of species distribution model, right? Then you can uh, use this approach to find out whether you can, where you can reintroduce the species if the species is close to the extinction. Then in this paper, uh, uh, he's my advisor, Peterson. He actually um, uh, tried to find out whether the species are conserved, uh, niches are conserved between two sister species. So this is a barrier here. And he, 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 cal he found out the, uh, the niches for the two sister, uh, sister species and showed that two sister, sister species have pretty similar niches. Then you can use the similar approach, like uh, like I told you, climate change in the so you project the model in the future. You can also do you can project the model in the past and then find out where the locations of refugia were in um, last glacial maximum. You have the data for climate data for those past uh, um, climate as well, so you can use those and do this cool applications. The other, um, the other example is you can see the connectivity between the patches so that you can, um, you know, conserve the, the species. Um, then it is not only in ecology, but you can also use this in evolutionary approaches. So you can find out the niches if they are conserved from past. So you con they constructed this uh, ancestral niche uh, constructions for barbler species, and then they found out the niches, how the niches are conserved and how they speciated using the phylogenetic approaches. Then this paper, I am one of the author in this paper. So what we did was we tried to find out the, the hotspots, the richness, the diversity in Florida for plant species, but it is not only the richness, but we also try to find out the phylogenetic diversity. So what do you mean by phylogenetic diversity? Phylogenetic diversity is nothing but you, um, from the phylogenetic tree, you see the, the species which are distantly related with each other. So, so the assemblages, plant assemblages, where they are distantly related, those you should conserve because they are going to have different traits. So this is one of the application what you can use. This is a very nice application. I am also one of the author in this paper. So here what they did, this is uh, the, the use is for human health. So here, what we did is we collected the data for um, venomous snakes and then projected their current distribution in the future. And then we, we showed that in the future, the snakes are going to shift and you are going to get, uh, you know, the, the, the venomous species are going to be there more. 
And so it's going to be a risk to your health. So these are some of the applications which you can use. Okay, that's good enough. But what, we sh what I should know before I use them? What should I do before I use them? So let us go back to the definition of ecological niche model, not definition, but the word niche in the ecological niche model. So there is a lot of confu confusion with the word niche in the literature. You, you will see people talking about niche in different with different meaning and someone else is talking niche with different meaning. So I'm going to talk about only these three people because they their work is seminal and very influential. So in 1917, Greenell, he defined niche as a habitat, but habitat may not be uh, necessarily a geographical area. It could be a log uh, in a plant, right? Well, uh, in a tree, that is, my ha that is a habitat for the species. So, which is not pretty, uh, which is not geographic. Then came in 1927, Alton, he defined niche as a functional role of an animal in a community. And then he assumed that he, the animal is going to get all the resources. So he assumed that the existence is there throughout the time. Later in 1957, Hutchinson, he defined, he combined the concepts of habitat uh, functions and then geography. And then he said that the niche is nothing but it's the n-dimensional hyper volume of environmental conditions where species can exist indefinitely. That means he is assuming here that the resources to survive for that species are available. He's, he's saying that the climatic condition or the abiotic conditions for that those species is available. And then it is based, he, he based it on environmental spaces, uh, which he called it as sinopoietic variables. And his definition of niche is very geographic in nature. So in ecological niche model, you should remember that we use the definition of niche defined by Hutchinson and not Alton and Grinnell. So <clears throat> what are these sinopoietic variables? The sinopoietic variables are basically variables which cannot be consumed, but they are dynamically linked at local scale. So you can assume example as light availability for plants because um, so the so the light is at a broader scale, but if you are going in a evergreen forest, then the availability, the plants are going to fight for the light because it's very local at that, at that scale. And then you have coarser resolution data available for such sinopoietic variables. You can say that climatic or geomorphological data are sinopoietic variables. And uh, so, uh, so, so these variables, so basically, then we go into the cons, uh, conceptual framework of ecological niche model. How do you define where the species can occur? So, so the first thing is for, that, for the species, the physiological requirements, or you can call it as abiotic requirements are met. The second is uh, the interaction with other species. So the biotic requirements such as uh, food, other resources, competition, predator, prey, all those exist. So the biotic, uh, biotic requirements are met. So you can say that this green circle is all the abiotically suitable uh, environment for the species, but you will not find the species here because the biotic requirements are only found th in this area, right? Similar case with biotic. Okay, so these biotic and abiotic conditions are available, but what about my species cannot reach to that, uh, reach to that, uh, reach to those resources? So then the important factor of accessibility area comes into picture. So then the third factor is M, which is movement, which could be the dispersal limitation, which could be a barrier because of, uh, you know, like uh, river or mountain ranges or whatever. So the so so where these three conditions are met, you are going to get the distributions. So this is like your occupied area. So this is this is uh, from this place, like from this region, you are going to draw your occurrence data, right? You are going to go to the field where all these conditions are met, and you get your the occurrence of your species. But 
uh, the range here, which is denoted as GI, which is invariable geographic range, is where if by somehow your species goes and crosses this barrier and lands here, then it has this whole region where it can invade. So that is your geographically uh, invadable area. So this is the framework what you should always keep in mind when you use your ecological niche models. So uh, there is one which is Altonian noise hypothesis. I think I should touch very briefly upon it. It is, it is assumed that when you, when you go at a broader scale, uh, the biotic requirements and abiotic requirements becomes close to each other. So meaning if the suitable climate is available, then you have biotic requirement usually available. Sometimes it is not true, but this is the Altonian noise hypothesis. We assume that the biotic requirements are there because we are working on a very broad spatial scales. So, <clears throat> So how, 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 okay, so this is like uh, a BAM framework we saw, but how is it done practically, how it is done, right? So the thing is you have this geography, so you divide your geography into small grids, which is called as the resolution of your grid, that is spatial resolution of your grid. And each grid will have the background environmental conditions associated with it. And then your species are going to be within the subsets of that uh, uh, conditions, uh, environmental conditions. So um, assume here, I have these uh, graph, look at the left graph where you can see uh, these regions, uh, X axis is temperature, Y axis is precipitation. And I am looking at uh, warm and, uh, you know, uh, more uh, warm and wet uh, climate here in this area, right? Okay, so this axis is a uh, uh, degree decimal multiplied by 10. That's why you are seeing 100, 230, but which is actually 30 degrees Celsius here. And then the yellow area here is like cold and dry environment. So what happens? Uh, this is your environmental space on the left side and how does it relate to the uh, geographical space? So when you select the grids on in the environmental space and see how it looks in the geographical space, you can see that um, Jammu Kashmir and Himalayas has been selected. And when you see warm and wet climate, you see uh, north, north eastern region and Western Ghat is selected. So there is always this interplay between this geographical space and environmental space happening uh, in, in the niche models. So you basically train your uh, model into environmental space and project it on the geographical space. That is how the niche model works. So uh, assume here I was talking briefly about the BAM framework. Now this is this, sorry, this is my uh, GO that is occupied range for Edis uh, Egypti. And you can see that it, the native range is here. Actually it should be it should be whole India, I guess, but the model was uh, based on a different occurrences and our occurrence set. So it's giving you this uh, uh, distribution. And then suppose if you increase your M, then what happens? The species go to different geography. And then how does it look? It invades into uh, South America, it invades into US, it invades into Africa and uh, so other places. So basically your M is very important uh, when you def design your niche models. Now, what is the role of GIS here? Well, if you know GIS, it's very good because it's going to ease your life because you need GIS knowledge to clip your rasters, to resample your rasters, or you visualize your model results. But is, is not necessarily you should know GIS. You can run uh, niche models without in knowing anything about GIS. Some softwares like Diva GIS has some modeling facility to do, to do those, but it's always better to have GIS knowledge. Now what happens, like how, how the model results, how good the model results are. So you should always remember, if you don't provide good information, you are not going to good results. So the meaning is garbage in and garbage out. So you should, when you build your model, you should be very careful about how you uh, develop your models. And then 
you should not get lured with the complicated technology. Don't use very complicated uh, models which you cannot really interpret. So, so the factors what you should consider about when you design your niche models is your accessible area. Don't define your accessible area as rectangles or political boundaries, right? And also not like uh, course range maps. You can use range maps as the baseline, but do something about it, like make the buffer or something more and then use that as your accessible area. Always consider the dispersal capacity of your species you are working with. Know the species biology, its ecology, so that, that you can use in the species distributions here. So uh, you should read this paper, Barve et al, 2011, where we showed with the simulation how, um, so we, we use this virtual species and we showed how the uh, size of M matters in model parameterization, model validation and model comparison. So uh, basically I think my time is running out. So maybe I will speed up a little bit. So you, you read that paper and you will know how you design your M. It could be based on the biotic region. You can just uh, predict it uh, in the future, just, uh, uh, just read the literature and find out where it was there in, uh, in the past and design your uh, M region. Then the next one is occurrence data. So you should, uh, you, you all must be knowing this website, GBIF, which is Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which has a lot of uh, occurrence data available and you can take uh, th those data to build your niche models. So you can use those, augment it with your primary biodiversity data, uh, geocode them and use it. Uh, then always think about your BAM framework from where my data is coming. The, the thing is, here that you get your occurrence data not from uh, all the okay so this is these are your occurrences but you don't know occurrences are presences because you have seen that species but um, so don't look at this complicated this is little complicated diagram but the your true presences is going to be if the species is uh, if if that location is accessible to the species if that species uh, if that location is abiotically suitable, if that location is biologically suitable, and if that location when visited by an observer, he saw that species. If that is the case, then it's a true presence. If he visited, the observer visited, but he did not see it, and then he say that uh, the, the, the observation was not perf uh, done perfectly, then it's a false presence, right? So then look at this absence that the species, the, that the grid is not accessible to the species, which is, but it is abiotically suitable and biotically suitable, visited by observer and uh, uh, observation is correctly performed, but it is absent due to inaccessibility of the cell. So uh, you should uh, basically know what are your presences and absences. So basically your presences are actually real presences, but your absences are not abs uh, are not true absences. It could be because there is identification error. Uh, uh, sorry, it could be because there is non-accessibility. It could be because it's not suitable. It could be because there is not, no sample is done. It could be because there was no report done previously in the past. So you should give more weightage to your presences because presences are true presences. Then, but then in the presences, there is data could be biased spatially. So you should take care of it, how you can remove the bias from the data so that when you uh, develop the model, uh, it's going to be uh, easier uh, uh, without any errors. And then there are different kinds of ecological niche models. There are only presence only niche models like bioclim domain, Mahan, Mahalanobis distance. They use only presences. They don't consider anything about absences. There are presence absence models like uh, GAMS and GLIMS and boosted regression trees. There are a few more there. Uh, so there where you are very sure about the absences because you are working at a very local scale and you know about the absences and presences, use those presence absence models. Then there is a model which is more popular in the, uh, in the field is presence and pseudo absence model, Maxent, which is like they take the presences, generate pseudo absences, and then generate the response surfaces. 
but those pseudo absences could become a presence in your data output. So basically you collect your data, you collect, you collect your environmental data, collect your occurrence data, apply the modeling algorithm, and then generate the surfaces and predict the species where it can occur either in the present time or in the future time or in the past time. But you should be always careful about the model extrapolation. The thing is, uh, suppose, uh, suppose this is uh, your uh, response to the variable, one environmental variable, and this is a suitability, but your occurrences are coming only within this gray region. So how the model is going to perform for the other uh, values for that particular environmental variable. It is going to either assume that after this value, my uh, the response to the species is going to be constant. So it is clamping or it is going to do extrapolation. So as the temperature goes, my species is going to survive. That is what it is going to assume. So you should be careful when you do model uh, uh, a model building that the model extrapolation and clamping is going to affect your model. So what are the advantages and limitations of SDMs in ecology and con conservation? You can use broad, uh, you can use ecological niche models at broad spatial scale, broad temporal scale, you can, you can use for many species and you don't need much data, but they are very coarse and they are not mechanistic. So they are not really considering the physiological tolerances of the species. They are typically static and they are correlative. So sometimes people don't like it, but they have good advantages if you are using it with a, uh, with a better framework and uh, better understanding, then you can do wonders with ecological niche models. So with that, I think I will stop. And uh, I don't know if I have to take the questions now or later. Yes, Narani, you can uh, stop uh, screen share and kindly sure. uh, put on your video. Okay. That was a very lucid and excellent presentation, uh, giving a view into niche modeling and discussing the various nuances of uh, ecological niche, which has already been always been a debatable uh, topic. We've always uh, debated on the niche. And what I really liked from your talk, which I'm going to take home, is uh, you talked about data, garbage in and garbage out. But for me, it'll be like for ecosystems, garbage in and the monster of global warming out. So we will take this message from you. And we have several questions. They are complimenting you, all the participants, for such an excellent presentation. And I'll take a question from Samrat Banerjee, research scholar. He's also, uh, I'll take a question from Samrat Banerjee. He's a research scholar and a very active participant with us uh, in this webinar. He's asking, is, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. He's asking uh, whether there is a difference in uh, SDM and ENM. Right. It's a very good question. And uh, species distribution modeling. It's a very good question. And there are a lot of debates about whether you call it as SDM or ENM. So I would say that, uh, you know, there is a subtle difference between SDM and ENM. SDM is basically you are only looking at uh, the species distribution at that particular time. But when you talk about ecological niche models, it is you are going to look at the distribution of the species in current time or future time or past time or in a different geographical space. So you are, so that's the difference in ecological niche model and species distribution model. So if you are trying to do only the distribution of the species at a local scale, you call it as species distribution model because it is going to be very, very local. But if you want to see how what is the potential of my species to survive in other space, then you call it as ecological niche model because your uh, idea of model projection is going to come into the picture because the relationships between the current time, uh, basically the, the current occurrence date current background environmental data and the occurrence data, those relationships you are going to assume that they are going to remain same and then you project it. So you are going to get the niches of that species in a different space or time. So that's the subtle difference, I would say. I think you are muted, Vishwarupa. 
Yeah, thank you, Narayani. I hope, Samrat, your question has been answered. We have another very interesting question from, we have a very, very interesting question from uh, Dr. Sapan Mandal. Is there mm -hmm. any practical application of sinopoetic study in mangrove forests? Is there any uh, practical application? Well, well, the literature in ecological niche modeling is growing so much that it is really hard to keep up with the literature and I haven't read any such studies. Thank you. We, so uh, we, you have scope to work on it, you know, absolutely. if you are working on mangroves. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from uh, one of our participants. Why GIS knowledge is not needed for distribution modeling? You said you may or may not uh, know about yeah. it. Right. So if you, if you have like, if you, if you can just gather the data, open the files there, you don't need deep GIS knowledge in it. You can just run the program and it works. Right. So you don't need deep GIS knowledge, but if you have the GIS knowledge, it is going to be useful because then the errors, what you are going to get, the problems you are going to face, you are going to solve it pretty easily. So it is not necessary that you should have a deep GIS knowledge in uh, to run the niche models. Thank you, Narani. Actually, there was another part to Samrat's question where he asked about, could you name some softwares for SDM and EDM? Could you just so, give a brief? Uh, okay, so there are various uh, softwares. Um, Maxent is one such popular software. Then in Diva GIS, you can run uh, some of the uh, niche models like BioClaim, which is uh, climate envelope model. So what it does is it just it, it, for every variable it draws a square for uh, your occurrences, and then it tries to see that multiple multiple squares and which are those conditions, and then it, it builds it. So uh, basically, that is these are the softwares what people usually use. Uh, but then uh, in R, you can use uh, multiple uh, softwares like GAMS and GLEAMS and others, other things which are presence absence models. Also, there are there is this uh, ensemble modeling in R which you can do. So multiple models they build and then uh, they get the ensemble of those models and then you get the regions uh, where uh, you can find uh, basically the distribution, right? But then with, with multiple uh, species, uh, sorry, with multiple models, people think that the, uh, you know, that the truth of that species distribution is better because you have more models predicting the same area. So it's up to you what you want to do, right? Thanks, thank you. I think Maxent would be good for beginners, Samrat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a very interesting question from uh, Dr. Mitu De. She asks, uh, mm -hmm. can this niche model be used to, uh, for pollinators like insects? So you can actually use it, but you know, it is, it is at a pretty finer scale, I would say for insects. Uh, but there are people, those who are doing niche models for insects, like mosquitoes, you see so many niche models done for mosquitoes. But uh, for insects, I would say that the biotic requirements are pretty much tightly, uh, tightly related, right? Because many insects like pollinators, butterflies, you see that the host plants are very necessary for them. So you just cannot take only the abiotic conditions. Of course, you can get the coarser, um, what, the distribution, which is not bad. So you can actually use it. It's not, but how much you trust on it, because you need to have some biotic component is my understanding. So there will be requirement of more modifications in the modeling. Thank you I for think so. the answer. Uh, Mitude, I hope your question is answered. And we also have a large, Narayani, we have a large number of participants on YouTube Live. We are taking questions from there too. We have mm -hmm. Manisha Mandal who is asking, ma'am, uh, what is a Grenadian niche? What is the difference between Grenadian niche and Eltonian niche? If you could answer, ma'am. Oh, oh my God, this is a difficult <laughs> question. And I don't think I can answer it. You might have to read the literature because it's, it's a... 
Yes, Nishi. It's a difficult that... question. Yeah. No, I don't think I can answer this question. Okay. This is I mean, a... you have to read the literature. It's big debate there. So what? Ask for Manisha features? then. Manisha, you really need to go into it and <laughs> look it. This is so, an interesting so, yeah. outcome of the webinar for you. You'll be knowing more about it when you go. About yeah. It. So I think read this book because he in this book they talk a lot about this. Could you just name it, Narani, please? Yeah. Oh, oh, I think it is reverse, right? It is ecological niches and geographic distribution by Peterson et al. I'll and, I'll just type it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, that will be great. And with that, actually, we have many more uh, questions from our participants, which we might forward to you in spite of your busy schedule. Yeah, 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 yes, of course. We would like to thank you once again for making time and creating this absolutely lucid presentation which would uh, really benefit all our participants especially our student participants and with that uh, thank you once again narayani we wish you great luck in life good health for your family and yourself thank you and in this thank pandemic, you. please stay safe and uh, we move on to our next technical session uh, technical session two i invite my colleague dr priyanko dhar to kindly uh, take over, and he'll be introducing our second speaker, Dr. Devabrutu Shaha, from the Ta Transdisciplinary University of Health Sciences and Technology, Bangalore. And also, I request our co host, uh, Dr. Shuchishmita Chakraborty, to kindly preside over this technical session. Ma'am, kindly, over to you all. Good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Debarbrutu Shaha, who is going to talk to us about threat assessment and monitoring conservation of Indian biodiversity following IUCN tools. Dr. Debarbrutu Shaha, Assistant Professor from the University of Transdisciplinary Health Science and Technology, Bengaluru, has over 18 years of research experience in conservation biology, community awareness, and education. He has done his PhD work on plant ecology in high altitude rugged terrains of Western Arunachal Pradesh, India, under the joint supervision of GB Panth Institute of Himalayan Environment and Development, Almora, and Assam University, Shilchar. However, his initial interest in research in biodiversity conservation was supported by MacArthur Foundation USA. Dr. Shaha has wide experience of doing research and project implementation in association with various prominent institutions such as Ministry of Environment and Forest, New Delhi, United Nations Development Program, New Delhi, Indian Institute of Forest Management, Bhopal, State Forest Research Institute, Itanagar, and G.B. Pant Institute, Itanagar. Dr. Shaha has published many research papers on ecological economics and non-timber forest products in various national and international journals. Dr. Shaha was associated with the exercise of conservation, assessment, and management plan for medicinal plants in Nagaland, Manipur and Tripura. He was also associated with the preparation of the national strategy for threat assessment of Indian biodiversity. He also has experience working with the International Union for Conservation of Nature for assessing the threat status of medicinal plants in India and published 47 Indian medicinal plants in the IUCN Red List along with his team. Now, I would like to request Dr. Devaprat Shah to deliver his talk. Hello. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? 
Hello. Yeah, you are perfectly audible, uh, Dr. Shah. You can carry on. <clears throat> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I am thankful to the organizing team for inviting me in this uh, exciting platform to share my, you know, experience related to threat assessment. Uh, till now, we are listening to Dr. Narayani, and I know her personally. She was she has been doing excellent research on uh, biodiversity conservation and niche modeling. In fact, this niche modeling is also an important tool for threat assessment. And I will explain it uh, later on during my discussion. Uh, well, the uh, title of my disc, uh, talk, uh, discussion is threat assessment and monitoring conservation status of Indian biodiversity uh, following IUCN tools. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah, now uh, we always, you know, before going to the core of the discussion, let us have a look at uh, the biodiversity conservation. Why, you know, it is a global concern. See, if we see this, uh, you know, slide, we find that uh, the biotic factor is one of the important component of the ecosystem and in, uh, in this in a process, we get many ecosystem services from the ecosystem functions. And our existence, I mean, uh, the existence of human uh, kind is dependent on these uh, services. Four major services are there, like, you know, provisioning service, then, you know, regulating service, then supporting service, and then cultural services. Now, you know, in this uh, pandemic scenario, uh, you know, we are suffering from COVID-19. Have we thought about why it is happening, you know, across the globe we are suffering and the nature is unable to control? Uh, actually, the fact is we, a uh, human, you know, race is responsible for that. Our anthropogenic activities are, you know, responsible for this. We have uh, done some unsustainable developmental you know, activities uh, which has affected the, the global ecosystem. Is that it has created some loophole in the ecosystem. And uh, ultimately, you know, now nature is unable to contain this disease, unable to you know, stop this. So, but there are uh, services in, in you know, as usual, there are services which actually control, the nature controls this diseases. Here I wanted to say, suppose uh, from here, if we eliminate this biotic factor, what will happen? There will not be no interactions with the biotic factors and ultimately the global ecosystem will collapse and we will be deprived of whatever you know, benefits. Even the environment is also benefited from these service, services. So ultimately we'll be nowhere so that's why we are giving so much of importance to biodiversity conservation. And in this regard, IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, they have done excellent research, I mean, excellent uh, work uh, in biodiversity conservation. They are the observer in UN after their establishment in 1948. They have done a lot of uh, uh, you know, implementation at global level, implementation of uh, intergovernmental, you know, uh, conventions for biodiversity conservation. So, and in 1964, IUCN has come up with few, you know, categories and criteria, I mean, uh, for threat assessment. And uh, it was, it has been, you know, evolved over the year and uh, the version changes, but uh, it is upgraded. Let me tell you what are the different, next slide, please. There are nine different uh, categories in uh, IUCN you know, guidelines for threat assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. I have already uh, changed the slide. Do you want me to change once more? This is yeah, ICU and tools for yeah. threat assessment. Yeah, okay. yeah. Next slide, please. All right. 
Yeah. Now here you can see there are nine different categories, like extinct, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, least concern, then data deficient, and not evaluated. So these are the nine categories under which we can, you know, keep uh, the species after threat uh, assessment. This is for global assessment. Let us keep it in mind. But for regional assessment, there are many regional assessment at national level or regional level, which uh, has two more uh, categories, like uh, you know, uh, extinct, uh, regionally extinct, and not applicable. No, for some reason, if it is not uh, applicable, then it, it is kept like that under this category. Next slide, please. So uh, to uh, assess uh, the species and keep uh, the species under these uh, nine categories, there are five major criteria for threat assessment. And these uh, are done based on population decline, you know, geographical range in the form of extent of occurrence or area of occupancy, then small population size and decline, then very small and restricted population. Then ultimately the fifth uh, criteria is uh, quantitative analysis indicating the probability of extinction in the wild. So these are the five major criteria based on which we assess a particular species. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, yeah, so uh, to keep a particular species, suppose if, uh, let us take an example of critically endangered species. Suppose a species, when it can be kept under uh, critically endangered species. Next slide, please. There are a few threshold level, okay? Under, uh, if we assess a species under population decline, there are few threshold level. And this species should be, you know, uh, like it, it, if it is observed, estimated, inferred, or suspected that the population reduction is of more than 90% over the last 10 years or three generation time period. And most important thing here we need to note here is that if the cause is understood, reversible, and the cause is ceased, then only we can keep it under criteria A1. There are four criteria under this uh, category, I mean, criteria A, that is population reduction. First one is A1, next one is A2. When it, we can apply this A2 criteria when you know, we don't know the reason, the cause, causative factor, if it is not uh, uh, seized and if it is not reversible, then we go to A2. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. And yeah, obviously in A1, there are some uh, sub criteria also to support uh, the uh, A1. Okay. Whether it is directly direct observation and index of awareness appropriate to the taxon if it is a decline in area of occupancy or extent of occurrence. So these are the sub criteria we need to uh, see you know, which is more applicable to that species and accordingly we keep the criteria. Now, as I have already told A2 here, if you read here, uh, the causes may not have ceased or may not be understood or uh, may not be reversible, then it should be A2. Next slide, please. Here also we need to apply the sub criteria A to E as it is written here. And uh, we need to understand that here, if you see the threshold level of uh, population decline changes, like, like in the first A1, we cap 90% or more than 90% population should be declined. But in case of A2, we have told it should be 80% decline means because in the first one, A1, we we understood the cause. So there is a you know, you know, easy way to you know, contain or you know, go for conservation of that species. But if we don't know the cause, means it is more dangerous. So that's why they have kept 
80%, even if 80% of the population is declined, then also it is kept under critically endangered. So you can understand how, you know, rationally, how scientifically they have used the threshold level for uh, identification of a species or to keep a particular species under a particular categories. Now, here A3, and suppose if a particular species is, uh, you know, uh, suspected to be met within, you know, 80% of population decline met within the next 10 years or three generation time, whichever is the longer, you know, it, it, it says that it, it is talking about the future uh, implication of a particular uh, uh, human anthropogenic activities. Suppose construction of dam. If a dam comes up and uh, if it is, you know, somehow we understand uh, 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 through scientific data, we can correlate that 80% of or more than 80% population will be declined and in the next 10 years, then we have to keep it. And uh, uh, the species should be you know, assessed with the criteria A3. And obviously there are sub-criteria B to E. Again, there are criteria A4. Here, uh, it is considered that if a species has already been declined in the past, and there's a probability of you know, reduction in the future also, and the threshold level is more than 80%, 80 or 80% uh, in the next 10 years, then we can use this criteria. Now, this till now, we are talking about the uh, you know, population reduction. Now, this is the criteria B, where we utilize the geographical range as a criteria for threat assessment. And here, geographical range in two ways. One is extent of occurrence, and another one is area of occupancy. I, if you recall, uh, it's already explained about how to you know, calculate or uh, the way we can understand uh, the, ex the geographical range of a particular species is distribution range. And uh, so uh, in this way, we can utilize the you know, niche modeling as a tool for this assessment also, and we can put a species, whether it is uh, distributed in 100 square kilometer or 2,000 uh, square kilometer, 2,000 square kilometer. By this technique, we can assess and we can put on a different threshold level. Here also, there are sub criteria, whether it's severely fragmented or known to uh, exist at only a single locations, or it is continuing decline. And uh, this is, uh, those sub criteria are linked to that. So accordingly, we can put the species in those criteria. Now let us understand what is extent of occurrence and what is area of occupancy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, if you see this uh, you know, image here, if these are the population distributed and if we draw the line in a circumference and uh, the total area is called the extent of occurrence of this particular species. And it should not be, it has been told that it should not be, the outer angle should not be less than 180 degree. You see, this is more than 180 degree angle. It shouldn't be less than, that means you cannot come here and join here like, this. I, I mean, uh, you cannot uh, leave some area which comes actually comes under the extent of occurrence. Okay. And next one is area of occupancy. Now here, the area of occupancy is uh, where we calculate the grids. Here, in between these popula two popula subpopulations, we, there are some space. We don't calculate this area, but only those grids where this particular uh, subpopulations are you know, falling. And we calculate those areas and estimate what is the total area of occupancy. So like this, we uh, try to uh, estimate what is the area of uh, extent of occurrence and area of occupancy. And accordingly, we assess the species. Next slide, please. Here again, uh, there are some uh, sub criteria, whether it is extremely fluctuation, uh, population is fluctuating extremely, 
and whether it is fluctuation is in extent of occurrence or area of occupancy or number of locations or subpopulation, which is the factor uh, associated with this population. So accordingly, we put it under this uh, criteria. Similarly, here, uh, area of occupancy, it is 10 square kilometer and uh, whether it is severe, it is for critically endangered I'm talking about. So for endangered, the uh, area should be more, I mean, it's uh, around 250 square kilometer like this. And here, there are two other sub criteria, severely fragmented or known to exist at uh, only a single location. If it is like that, then we uh, tell that is 2A criteria. I mean, B2A criteria, okay? So like this, we here also continue decline for and link to which uh, factors, extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, or both area and extent and or quality of habitat, which one is reduced? Whether quality of habitat is destroyed, then this also will be linked. So like this way. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Again, again, here, extreme fluctuation in any of the following, or, I mean, similar criteria are uh, applicable. Now, criteria C, population size estimated to a uh, number fewer than 250 mature individuals. Either. This is related to, like, as I told, uh, if it is population is smaller and uh, declining, and what percentage is declining? As continuing declining of at least 25% within three years or one generation, whichever is longer. Okay, so in that way, if, if a particular species comes under this criteria, we put it on a C1, like this C2 is also there. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Dr. Kush, it will take some time to buffer. Okay, no issue. So, yeah. So here again, uh, a continued decline observed projected or inferred in numbers of mature individuals and at least one of the following A to B, which one is matching with this? No subpopulation estimated to contain more than 50 mature individuals. If any of the population having more than 50 individuals, mature individuals means is really threatened. And this criteria should be attached with this 2A, you know, criteria. Like again, B, extreme fluctuation in number of mature individuals, okay? Now, population size estimated to number fewer than 50 mature individuals. If a particular population is very, very small, that is only 50 mature individuals, and it is restricted, like if it is endemic or particularly uh, in a particular area, if it is you know, uh, confined, then it is kept under this category D. Okay, and then uh, another one is a quantitative analysis where we do actual uh, assessment and predict based on the uh, you know, assessment, what uh, if it is uh, extinction is more than or equal to 50% within 10 years or three generation time, whichever is longer, then we kept it under critically endangered species. So, but for the endangered and uh, vulnerable, the threshold level is different. Next. <clears throat> so, uh, now, this is in this background, uh, you have now come to know what are the different categories and criteria and how it is applied in uh, assessing the threat status as per the IUCN norms. Now in this background, we uh, from our institute, Transdisciplinary University, we have done uh, a kind of rapid threat assessment across our country. Uh, it's called conservation assessment, management prioritization assessment, okay? and. Uh, here also we have applied uh, this assessment, uh, I mean, uh, applied those IUCN categories and criteria, but it is a regional assessment. Now, how, how do we do this? Let us see and have a look to this. Next slide, please. Here actually we identify a particular, you know, geographical uh, unit, I mean, uh, botanical unit. And this botanical unit should be as per the taxonomic database working group. And the particular area should have a floristic documentation like we call flora of uh, Assam or flora of 
Meghalaya, flora of West Bengal. So this kind of flora should be there and the wild resource are, should be managed at a state level, okay, uh, through state forest department. If it is uh, managed like that, then we can take up that particular state and go for regional assessment. So next slide, please. So once we uh, pick up this species, we need to shortlist uh, around 100, 150 species for, to go for threat assessment. And how do we, uh, you know, uh, make the shortlist that is based on some criteria again, like taking different life forms, okay? And then parts used. Suppose if a particular plant's uh, bark or uh, uh, roots are used, it's more you know, uh, threatened, like uh, cinnamon. If uh, barks are collected in, uh, at a time, whole plant, uh, you know, the plant may die. So that, that's the threat. So based on those criteria, we, uh, you know, uh, shortlist the species that phylogenetic distinction, monotypic, for example, atleria, then narrow distribution, whether it is endemic, then also we pick up the species, then commercial exploitation. Suppose some species are uh, traded in high rate and exploited from the wild indiscriminate way, then we have to pick up that species also for threat assessment. So that, these are the different criteria we take for uh, shortlisting the species. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. And then what we do, we uh, circulate this uh, list of the species among the you know, various stakeholders like taxonomists, field botanists and all, uh, take their views. And uh, then we go for a pilot like uh, uh, workshop, okay, preliminary workshop. Why? Because the, uh, the stakeholders, they should understand how this IUCN categories and criteria is applied for threat assessment. And they should come back after that with all the informations like information related to uh, reproductive biology, ecology of the plant, then habitat, what is the habitat status of that particular species. All these informations will be uh, there when the next time they come for the actual camp assessment. So next we go for, once it is done, then obviously uh, once it is shortlisted, we, our team uh, also go in the field to verify the facts and assess the uh, different uh, factors, like whether habitat is really destroyed, or whether it's highly exploited or not, all this too is a called ground truthing kind of exercise. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so these are the few uh, slides of our camp assessment we did in Nagaland. You can uh, see uh, one of the taxonomists, renowned taxonomist of our state, Professor Epidash. He was also there. And uh, this way we call all the experts, actually. And uh, there was uh, one uh, part, uh, director of Botanical Sarov of India, like they all expertise we call and uh, even the traditional healers and traders you have seen. So uh, we take the experts view and obviously the data and then we assess the species. Next slide, please. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so after that, what we do, I mean, th this is a uh, you know, camp uh, format which need to be uh, you know, filled up. And you can see there, whatever we have discussed in IUCN category criteria, all are here, and this should be filled up. And there, there will be preliminary uh, discussions. Uh, and uh, with that consensus, uh, category should be given. And once it is assessed, then finally we go publish it uh, as a camp report, as a state camp, camp report. Like uh, in uh, for West Bengal, there is a uh, you know a report, camp assessment report. Okay, next, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So these are the few uh, slides of our field. You know, once we, as I told, uh, once we uh, do the preliminary uh, workshop, then uh, people uh, should go to the field, see observe the status and then this data should be incorporated. Next slide, please. It was uh, in North Bengal, next, yeah. 
So the, you can see, uh, this is a few slides of my PhD work. And uh, this is uh, a picture of Elysium griffithii, one of the important medicinal plants found in western part of Arunachal Pradesh. And you can see the terrains and the rug, uh, uh, the difficult to I know, actually travel in those areas, but we had to go and collect the data, interact with the local people, uh, tribal people. So yeah, so these are the exercises we need to do for this threat assessment. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. So also we need to see what is the regeneration status of the species and what part actually this Elysium fruit is so we call uh, 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 star anise, okay? Star anise and it is used in uh, uh, masal, I mean spices also. And uh, it has also medicinal uh, value. So, so these are the data we need to collect from the field. We have to incorporate and it's highly traded. It, I have uh, tracked the trade route of this particular species. It has it goes from West uh, North Arunachal Pradesh to West Bengal and then goes to Delhi market and then international market. So yeah, and uh, these are the few slides uh, uh, of those local people, uh, how they collect uh, the medicinal plants from high altitude, and I actually accompanied them to just try, uh, try to try to understand how they actually collect what is their process of preservation and uh, collection and uh, coming to the market and selling it. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, so these are the uh, few pictures of our camp assessment. Finally, this uh, outcome is uh, the publication of the report and then last uh, conservation action and monitoring uh, uh, of the species at state level. What next? Let us see what we do. Once it is assessed, uh, species are assessed, categorized under different categories, threatened categories, what do we do? Next slide, please. So then we go for systematic conservation action program. What is this conservation action program? We, we, we know uh, we can uh, conserve a species in different way, like in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. Here, in situ conservation is very, very thinking from evolutionary perspective. Unless and until we conserve the species, the gene pool of the species, we cannot really support the evolution of a particular species. So that's why you do this in situ conservation. And then obviously ex situ conservation. Let us, let me show you a few picture of this in situ conservation, ex situ conservation slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are the few picture of uh, MPC, medicinal plant conservation area of Uttarakhand, okay? There are, uh, I think, uh, seven MPC, Medicine Plant Conservation Area, established. After this camp assessment, once uh, we understood that these are the species which are threatened, then the conservation action program was taken and this uh, conservation area was established. And this is notified by the forest department, you remember. So, yeah. So, how do we do? Actually, once uh, the threat assessment is done, we try to find out the population, the viable population of the particular species and and that is done in involving the local community the forest department and once identified then it is established this mpca in west bengal also we have seven mpca and uh, and the two mpcs are in the high altitude and these are also uh, uh, that include many important medicinal plants starting from aconitum and all next slide please Next slide. Yeah, this is uh, uh, ex situ conservation. This is our university's ethnobotanical garden. You can see, and uh, here below, you can see our VC is uh, planting some endangered species here in the botanical garden. This is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, ex situ conservation. And here, this, you can see the huge nursery growing the seedlings of many threatened species. Uh, okay, and these are distributed among the locals and uh, properly planted in uh, a proper place. So these are the uh, activities we need to do for after this threat assessment. Uh, this is the conservation
yeah so I, and uh, uh, now let me talk about our achievements uh, what we have done uh, around uh, next slide please around 47 species uh, threatened species indian medicinal plants have been uh, you know assessed and uh, published in the iucn red list during uh, sorry here mistake it should be 2013 to 2015 and uh, obviously our uh, our institute was associated with iucn uh, chair and uh, they have helped us a lot i will uh, show you the list of the species let just go to the next slide next slide please yeah so this is one of the gymnocladus asamicas which has been uh, categorized as critically endangered species okay and uh, uh, yeah, there are many uh, authors. You can, if you see the Ravi Kumar, Dr. Ravi Kumar, Dr. Haridashan, they are renowned taxonomists from our country. And uh, Mr. Ved, and I was also associated with this assessment. Next slide. Next slide, please. Elysium Griffithi, as I have already shown you, uh, this is also assessed as an endangered species. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, and this Lilium polyphylum. So here it is. Uh, and uh, really uh, helped us in uh, this assessment also. Next slide, please. Nardostacus jetawansi is also high altitude Himalayan species. Uh, this was uh, assessed as critically endangered. Next slide. Coptis tita. This is endemic species in Northeast India and uh, it has been uh, assessed as endangered species. Next slide. These are the few species I'm showing the slide. Uh, if someone is interested, I, I'm giving you the link. If, if you uh, if I can share it if someone is interested to go through. You can go through the IUCN red list uh, and uh, download also those uh, informations and go see. Next slide, please. So I'll roll on uh, uh, through the list of the species, 47 species, what we have assessed. These are the species. Uh, please uh, go through. Next slide. Next slide, please. The aconitum, chashmantum, aconitum, heterophyllum, then cinnamon, white eye, comifera, white eye, coptis tita. I told already coptis tita and coccinia fenisterum. Next slide, please. Gymnocladus asamicus. Next slide. Yeah, Elysium griffithii. Okay. Nardostacai jetavansi. Next slide, please. Next slide. Then phyllanthus indifferent, then piper barberi. Salicea oblonga, Sassuria costas also included. So these are the total 47 species what we have assessed. And this is a global assessment we have done and uploaded in uh, and published in IUCN red list. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I would like to acknowledge uh, this uh, uh, people from IUCN the Dr. Dana Lemon, Chair, IUCN SSC Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, who were extremely helpful to me. And uh, during that assessment, the threat assessment during 2013 to 2015, she was, uh, uh, I mean, helped me a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, wherever we were stuck to, they guided us. And then Dr. Caroline Pollock, Dr. Shara Oldfield, Barbara, then Charles, Sire Catherine, so I, am, I convey my rigors and uh, my gratitude to uh, the people for uh, helping and uh, to assess mm -hmm. those 47 species. So with that, I will uh, come to the end of my presentation. Thank you all for uh, you know, patient lis uh, listening to the presentation. Thanks. If there are questions, I... <clears throat>
Thank Hello. you, uh, Dr. Shah, uh, for the wonderful presentation and for elaborating on the use of uh, various IUCN tools in threat assessment and monitoring of conservation of Indian biodiversity. Uh, I think uh, you brought about uh, uh, very important things during your uh, deliberation uh, and uh, Ours being a very rich biodiversity, our country being a very rich biodiversity, I think this is the need of the hour uh, for us to be aware of these endangered species and uh, go for the conservation. You talked about in situ and ex situ conservation also and the various techniques and tools also. I think uh, our students who are from both undergraduate and postgraduate level, uh, they will be highly benefited because I'm sure they didn't know uh, this aspect of conservation which you uh, put forth before us. Um, I'll take up the questions uh, from the, uh, both from the, uh, uh, I mean, YouTube and as well as uh, from the uh, Zoom platform. Uh, so uh, one question is, uh, and this is from uh, Manush Sweta Mishra, uh, she says, why camp assessment is done and what is its uh, significance in context of biodiversity conservation? Hello. There's a... Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, should Hello. I repeat the question? Hello. Hello. Dr. Shaha. Are you there? Hello. Hello. I think uh, we lost his connection. Uh yes dr shah i'll repeat the yes. question once more for yeah. you yeah. uh the question was from uh, shweta mishra and yeah. uh, she asked why camp assessment is done and what is its significance in context of biodiversity conservation yeah a uh, very interesting question see uh, uh I, as i told you there are two kinds of assessment one is uh, global assessment and there is a regional assessment. Camp assessment is a regional assessment. And the significance is this is a rapid kind of threat assessment where we take the help of other experts. And uh, because if you see the IUCN uh, red data, uh, the uh, information, they have till now they have uh, published, uh, assessed and published 120,000 species. And the target by 2020, at the end of 2020 is 1,60,000. There is a gap of 40,000 species. Now, this is the actually way we can, uh, the way out to actually complete the target. And this target is uh, a global target, in fact. So once we do this regional assessment, this will be complementary to the global assessment. That's why we uh, do this. And as I have already shown, once camp assessment is done, people are triggered, because scientists, the academicians, they are triggered by the threat status of the species and they pick up those species for more scientific research and you know, in-depth research for conservation action program. This is the significance of that assessment. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think she got the answer. And there's uh, another question. She had actually another question. Uh, she asked, what is the main name of IUCN red list? What are the IUCN categories? I think uh, one of the question you had already. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are nine. Uh, there are uh, uh, nine categories. I have already told for global assessment. There are nine categories for regional assessment. Two more categories are added here. One is uh, regionally extinct and uh, not applicable. And the main nine categories, as I told, extinct, extinct in the wild, uh, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, uh, near threatened, least concern, then uh, you know, uh, data deficient and uh, not evaluated. So these are the uh, nine major categories and criteria, as I told, so there are five major criteria based on which we uh, assess the threats. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is a question from YouTube. Uh, yes. This is being asked by uh, uh, Shapun Mondol. Uh, yes. If all the microorganisms were destroyed, what mm. will happen to human diversity? So, oh, see, uh, uh, if we go by ecological modeling and uh, if you see the ecosystem structure, the microorganisms play a very, very important role in, uh, you know, maintaining uh, the uh, you know, stability of the system. If we 
let, let me give one example, then you will understand it's very clearly how important it is. Now, suppose uh, if in a you know, deciduous forest, if you go during winter, you will find huge leaf fall under ground uh, on a uh, you know, forest floor. And if, and this is nothing but the locked energy, locked nutrient, okay? And if it is not properly decomposed and mixed with the soil, the nutrient cycling will be stopped and ultimately plants will be deprived of the nutrient and the seedlings. But uh, Dr. Shah? And maybe desertifications also. And a very important example, we can keep it in mind what will happen if there are no microbes. And ultimately, the biodiversity loss means our existence will not, will not uh, be nowhere, actually. Uh, all right, sir. Uh, so the next question is from Shikha Prasad. Uh, she says, uh, does species diversity follow any pattern? Yeah, yeah, obviously. The uh, diversity, if you see, you know, from North Pole to South Pole, and uh, with the uh, suns, I mean, particularly the uh, you know, intensity of light the, and the season, if you see, the pattern of biodiversity will change from place to place, okay, uh, with, with the season also. So there is, there is a link of uh, this pattern. There is a changes. Uh, all right, with sir. The, uh, with the uh, region. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, I do have a question, but I'll ask it at the end of the session. Uh, so this question is from uh, Dr. Ghosh, and she asks, has there been reassessment of your IUCN uploaded data after five years? And the second question is, when is the next camp? Uh, this is, I, I'm sorry, this is from uh, Bala Supramanya Sharma. Uh, this question okay. was from. Okay. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. See, uh, this uh, ecosystem is very dynamic, okay? And uh, the status is not you know, permanent or uh, constant. It changes with the dynamics of the forest. Now, that's why we have to reassess uh, the species after at least minimum five years, okay? And then we can understand. Now, sometime what happens if it is now, it is uh, uh, threatened and under critically endangered. And after uh, species recovery plan programs and conservation action program, it may come out if, uh, if we, see the threat status, it may come out of that threat status also. Who knows? I mean, that's why we have to reassess the species. And that is, uh, but unfortunately in India, due to lack of fund and, uh, you know, uh, strategy, it was uh, not followed till now. But the last year we did uh, 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 a lot of need assessment exercise across the country. And uh, we have come up with a strategy for threat assessment. This is a national strategy for threat assessment where it has been mentioned that it should be uh, with the proper uh, interval, there should be a camp assessment and involving many uh, renowned institution, institutions across the country. So that is uh, the in, in, uh, strategy for threat assessment. Uh, all right, yeah. sir, that's wonderful of you answering the thing. Uh, there is a next question from Monolina and uh, she says, I would be very grateful, sir. Uh, if you can answer my query, and her query is, how should young researchers address the address the correlates of vulnerability among the threatened species? Uh, see, uh, uh, it's a very interesting question. But then, see, uh, if you look into this, vulnerable comes under threatened group. If you see the categories in IUCN, uh, 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 the nine categories, this critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable are capped under threatened category. And the vulnerable category uh, capped under a lower threshold level of uh, population decline, either population decline or range of its uh, distribution, whatever we take. So uh, uh, obviously there is a lower threshold uh, category. So accordingly, if it falls under that category, obviously it is categorized as vulnerable. Um, Next, uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh... I think Monolina, your answer, your question has been answered properly. And uh, we have a question from a young student of ours. Uh, he's from third sem, uh, Dipanjan. And he asked, uh, if the humans become more advanced in future, just like 
things are happening now should mm-hmm. the biodiversity be completely destroyed by us or we will be extinct first so that is so yeah as in one. my first, second second slide i have already you know explained see the biotic organism actually they interact among themselves as well as with the surroundings the environment and this is the very basis of the global ecosystem and we we are the secondary uh, consumer okay uh, secondary level primary consumer are the plant plant diversity they produce the food and we take it we cannot produce food so if uh, the plant biodiversity is vanished so we'll be nowhere so i have already explained the uh, second slide that we as well as the environment actually are very much benefited from the you know ecosystem services which is the by product of uh, ecosystem functions so if uh, biodiversity is eliminated if the other uh, biodiversity is eliminated we will be nowhere so we have to learn how to coexist that's the answer yeah that's perfectly uh, all right thing we should learn to coexist otherwise i think this pandemic situation wouldn't have occurred in the first place yeah 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 Very so nice. this is a learning lesson for us and uh, I, now that uh, most of the questions has been answered i will uh, just take up my question to you and this is uh, like uh, for how many states the camp assessment has been done and hello. whether uh, in uh, hello can you hello, hear this my okay voice i'll start ah uh, yes i'll repeat once more uh, hello my co- hello can you hear me hello dr shah hello i think is is uh, having a hello can you please repeat your voice yes yes card? i'll do that i'll do that uh, i think there was some connectivity issue uh good fine my question to you is uh, like for how many states the camp assessment has been done and whether see western ghat is also very rich in biodiversity and i think there might be a lot of uh, this endangered species also there mm-hmm. so has anything been done there also yeah it's a very interesting question let me tell you till now we have done 20 for 20 states this camp expand recently uh, manipur uh, uh, then uh, nagaland and tripura we have completed last 3 uh, 4 years but uh, you know when camp assessment initiated in our country it was uh, obviously in association with uh, iucn then uh, uh, our institute and we initiated with the three southern states the karnataka kerala and tamil nadu so obviously we try to cover up and then uh, uh, the other states also kerala you know so that in the beginning itself uh, it was taken the southern states were taken and then we gradually uh, spread in other part of the country okay so that's it okay and thank you very and this uh, yeah Okay. Uh thank you very much for answering my okay. question but uh, then I have another question for you yeah, and this is going to be my last question and hopefully the last question for the interactive session also. Yeah, so please. uh, uh one uh, you while scrolling down so many examples you were giving about the certain species so mm-hmm. one uh, plant caught my eye and that is Gymnocladus uh, assamicus. Yeah. So uh, what is this role and what is I mean I know nothing about the plant and uh, oh, this is very important uh, this is very important uh, medicinal plants uh, it is uh, uh, main uh, distribution is in uh, western part of Arunachal Pradesh is uh, west coming district and you, you know the tawang and all that belt it is found and uh, it is endemic to that area okay and uh, the local people they collect uh, this uh, fruit of that species gymnocladus assamicus and locally they use as soap as a, like a soap nut they use it as a soap locally uh, and uh, uh, it is also used medicinally and uh, it's but its uh, regeneration is very very low i mean the germination rate is very low and that's why uh, there were some uh, niche modeling was done for that to understand its uh, distribution area and uh, one book has been published on that uh, all uh, species you can find to google uh, search so it's a very important species for the local people they collect it and uh, use for uh, you know as a even you know culturally also important the people i have seen in uh, monpa community uh, in west coming district they collect uh, the species keep at their home and whenever required uh, they use it and also use it in culture, culturally 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shaha, uh, for taking your time out and uh, delivering so such a nice and lucid yes. lecture. And there has been a lot of appreciation both uh, here uh, in the Zoom platform as well as in the YouTube platform. And uh, I think everyone got benefited from this uh, lecture, uh, your presentation. And I, I think they are asking for the link also. Uh, maybe yeah, we'll get I'll, back I'll to see. you and we'll then try and share with our participants yeah, please, too. Please. Okay, thank you very you. much. <laughs> thank yeah. you very much once again. <clears throat> and over to you, uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, <clears throat> for the next session. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. It was wonderful listening to you and uh, great uh, congratulations for all the hard work that has been published in IUCN and we can uh, uh, look into the conservation of these species. And hopefully many of us will take up such uh, guidelines to carry out uh, conservation and threat assessment of various species of our concern. Each of us have our soft corners for many species. Uh, with that, I thank you once again for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. We're wishing you good luck in life. We move on to our uh, next program. Uh, I invite my senior colleague, Dr. Shongita Gongopadhyay to kindly deliver a vote of uh, a speech of vote. Please, thank you, vote to everyone. Dr. Shongita Gongopadhyay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely, ma'am. Uh, yeah. It's my privilege to give the formal vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee. We are extremely thankful to our eminent speakers, Dr. Narayani Barve and Dr. Devudroto Shah. We have heard from them different state of art tools and techniques in biodiversity conservation using human and artificial intelligence. It is an enlightening experience for all of us. Particularly, they have ignited the young minds of our students to pursue their career in this direction. Our special thanks for Professor Bashok Choudhury Vice Chancellor, West Bengal State University for delivering the inaugural session. He is always beside us with his smiling face and enthusiasm in all our endeavors in spite of his busy schedule. We must thank our principal ma'am, Professor Papia Chakraborty, for providing us all the support and encouragement for organizing this webinar series. Being a botanist, she is an integral part of our department and we are grateful to her for being with us throughout. Our warm thanks for all the participants for being supportive throughout and raising thought provoking questions for making the sessions more interactive. Once again, I thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Mrs. Gongupadhyay, for such a warm uh, vote of thanks. And with that, uh, we are coming to an end of our uh, today's session. I uh, invite our host, Dr. Dipangshu Kumar Vishwas, to kindly uh, say a few words and close the session. And thank you all the participants. I'm signing off, Dr. Viswarupa Ghosh. And over to you, Dr. Dipangshu Kumar Vishwas. Thank you, madam. Well, we are at the end of today's session. Thank you everyone for being a part of this webinar. We will meet again on 4th September at 4 p.m. onwards. So feedback link has been given in chat box. It will active after the end of the session. So you all please submit the feedback. Until that, stay home, be safe. Now I will officially end the today's session. Thank you all and one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe.